the speech by Willie Loman in Arthur Miller's play, Death of a Salesman. Figure what the hell, life is short, a couple of jokes to himself. I joke too much. The smile goes. Another note on the title. When I was directing Dustin Hoffman and John Malkovich in Death of a Salesman for Broadway, we were on tour in Washington. I was walking with Arthur near the Watergate Hotel when he told me that unfortunately Malkovich wasn't well and might have to withdraw that evening. And Dustin was very upset about it. I said, I hope it doesn't make him cry. This was a reference to the fact that I was always trying to stop Dustin from crying <laughs> in the play. On the theory attributed to Edith Evans that the less you cry, the more they will. <laughs> Arthur didn't think what I said was at all funny, and he got extremely angry, and he said very loudly, that's enough of your goddamn jokes. <laughs> <laughs> the West End, Rex Harrison. Directing in the West End often means directing Rex Harrison or someone very like him. <laughs> Rex and I didn't get on terribly well. Here are some of the things that he didn't like about me. One, that I wanted him to be on time for rehearsal. <laughs> Two, that I wanted him to learn his line. Three, that I wouldn't let him be rude to the actresses. Four, my clothes. Five, that I wanted to direct the play. <laughs> but Rex and I had an uneasy truce. I think that something in the back of his tired but combative brain told him that I was going to stick it out until the last possible moment, which I did. He didn't fire me until after the show opened successfully in Wales. <laughs> Rex preferred arguments in front of a large cast. In his hotel room, he would agree to anything. He was charming at the Ritz. But in front of the company, he would throw his weight around, query every suggestion for a long time, and criticize other actors. One day I was trying to get him to stand up at a particular point. Now, I knew that standing up for Rex was not easy. I knew that he was 82, that he was tired and forgetful and hard of hearing. I also knew that if I suggested that he sit, he would want to stand. And if I suggested that he stand, well, you get the idea. <clears throat> but I was pretty sure that at this particular point, it would get a laugh, which it did, and that it would be a laugh for him, which it was, and it would help make everyone in the audience like him, which they did. But it was Hell's own job getting him to stand up on cue. Each time we tried it, he questioned it. Then he started making fun of me. I don't understand these Canadian directors, so it's bloody, so it's bloody movement. I mentioned that I wasn't Canadian. All this bloody movement, what good does it do? I suppose that in Canada they do plays this. <laughs> I reminded him gently, I think, that it had been difficult to get him to sit down at all. But now that he was, now he was happy with it. Perhaps he would come to like standing up as well. <laughs> Especially if he got a laugh. <laughs> bloody Canadians, all this movement. That did get a laugh from the other actors, around 30 of them. <coughs> it was getting out of hand. Rex, I said, I'm not even slightly Canadian, and I've directed 75 plays, and some of them have movement in them. <laughs> I saw one of them. There was quite a hush. Oh? More hush. Six characters in search of an author. Pause. At the National. Pause. It was bloody good. And there it was charm and wit and ability to think on his feet, once you, once you got in there. And everyone, everyone really laughed, laughed, especially me. And the truce was renegotiated. He paid me two more compliments. One, on the first night in Wales, he played the first act exactly as we had rehearsed it. And two, when he fired me, he said that John Dexter and I were the only two directors that he didn't get on with. <laughs> <laughs> the National Theatre, the writers. The writers whose plays I direct are usually the people I get to know best. <clears throat> With Samuel Beckett, it was only a slight acquaintance, but I felt close to him. Because I was directing Waiting for Godot at the National, I met him for one hour in a hotel bar in Paris one morning in September, the year that he died. My memory of him is fragmented. One, the first impression was covered by what I had been led to expect, but it also became the lasting impression an extremely courteous Anglo-Irish gentleman living near the center of Paris, near several hospitals, and meeting old age with grace and irritation. Two, the two things he seemed most interested in to do with me were my son, about to be born, and my interest in sport. Whenever I mentioned Jacob, or tennis, or golf, one of the warmest smiles you've ever seen broke out on his face. It was almost a grin, and almost audible. <laughs> In his youth, his family had their own lawn tennis court, and in the summer he spent all day playing golf by himself with two balls, one competing against the other. Hmm, I thought, waiting for Godot. <laughs> Five, 
his eyes were the brightest blue, with what I could swear were black crosses in the middle of them. <laughs> Six, just as the play Waiting for Godot seems to want to break dramatic molds, so he seemed resistant to any conversation about accepted theater practice, such as actors delving into the biography of characters or costume representing the history of a character. He displayed a surprising acting ability when he quoted lines from the play or sang either of the two songs. I suspect that like many playwrights, he was an actor monke. <coughs> Eight, he remembered well the Abbey Theater in the late 20s and 30s. Apparently he would go once a week and sit in the one and sixes, which were just to the right or left of the three shilling seats in the balcony. He was full of praise for the Abbey and its history. Nine, I am more and more convinced that the play is like one man's dialogue with himself, rather like the two Byzantine poems of Yeats, a dialogue inside a poet's head. Broadway, <laughs> Death of a Salesman. <clears throat> Once you've arrived, excuse me. <laughs> I've never done this before. <laughs> Once you've arrived on Broadway, you and your show are almost, are already almost certainly a success. Then you collect awards, give interviews, drink Harvey Wallbangers, and either date or avoid dating. <laughs> but getting there and convincing all the necessary people that you deserve to be there usually requires several months of hiring and firing, long nights in provincial hotel rooms, three or four hundred donuts, and a fair amount of shouting. <laughs> After a fairly sweet rehearsal period, mainly taken up with compliments being hurled back and forth and long lunch breaks. The company of Death of a Salesman, our playwright, a large technical staff, and I arrived in Chicago. We were all in the hotel and ready to work on the stage when we found that the set, consisting mainly of a small wooden house placed on a turntable, was not fitting onto the stage. Apparently, the stage at the Blackstone Theater in Chicago slopes down at the sides and none of our highly trained and highly paid technicians had known this. To this day, I wonder how that could have been, but I never dared ask. <laughs> so we decided to have a run-through without scenery on the mezzanine of the Hilton Hotel near the theater in one of those banquet rooms that even Willie Loman would have avoided. <laughs> All of us, except for our leading lady, who had not been able to recover from the one-hour flight from New York. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> true. And then repaired to her hotel, a much nicer hotel, the Ambassador East. The run through didn't go too badly, considering, but one of my notes to Dustin Hoffman afterward triggered a response that could only be called extraordinary. I suggested that he should pause and look at a suitcase with a tennis racket strapped to it before asking pathetically if a family had their own tennis court. I knew that would get a good laugh and prick any bubbles of sentimentality as it had for Warren Mitchell at the National. Dustin didn't like the idea. I asked him to try it. He thought the suitcase was in the wrong place. I said that we could move it. He said the furniture was in the wrong place. I said that we could move it, a little bit. Then he exploded. You're trying to turn us into a bunch of fucking English actors. What are you anyway? I can't stand this. I can't stand it. We are American actors. I'm not John fucking Gilgood. You can't do this to us. I won't put up with this. You need therapy. Your sex life is a mess. We are American actors. I won't turn my head like some little dancer to some fucking suitcase at some fucking count of one, two, three. This is insane. This and more for about six minutes. Then there was quite a pause. Then a couple of the others joined in. I was calm. I tried to explain what I was after and why. The other actors were on different sides of the issue. John Malkovich was on both sides. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember what they said, but they all talked a great deal. Then Dustin exploded again with more of the same. Then after a further ten-minute tirade, there was a long pause, after which Dustin apologized. He said he was sorry. They were all in a state because the set didn't work, and we couldn't get onto the stage, and we opened in two days, and because the leading lady was in her hotel room, probably drunk. <laughs> he was sorry. Don't worry, I said. Forget it. It's a great play, and it brings out great emotions. Nah, said Dustin. I do this on shit. 